All right. Uh, hello, everyone. We are uh, again together with my friend Jamie to talk about philosophy and books, in this particular case, uh, uh, fiction, because there is a lot of philosophy in fiction. But before we get there, let me just remind you that um, we already have a, our next appointment at the Philosophy Book Club set for January 10th. It's also a Sunday, as usual, and it's also 1 p.m. Eastern Time, as usual. The book in question will be entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women by Kate Mann, and we will have Kate actually as a guest. This is going to be the first time we're going to, we have an uh, author as a, as a guest. It would be hard to have today's author as a guest, I suppose, because he's dead, long dead. But um, so I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be an interesting topic. I'm reading a book right now, and, and Kate is a wonderful uh, writer and, and uh, philosopher. So I'm looking forward to that one. If you want to register for that event, you go to meetup.com and look for Philosophy Book Club. Uh, if you want to watch... Uh, past episodes of the Philosophy Book Club with Jamie and I, uh, you go to the uh, to Vimeo and, and just do a search for the Philosophy Book Club channel. And other than that, uh, let, let's get us started with today's topic, uh, which is Death in Venice, a novella by Thomas Mann with philosophical overtones that uh, make links and, and, and uh, connections with anything from Plato's Symposium to, to uh, Nietzsche's. So, let us get started. I mean, I have a few notes, Jamie, but what was your first overall impression of, of the story? Um, so I, I found this really interesting and it was sort of funny to me because I'm also, um, I'm rereading the Mandarins in another book mm -hmm. club. Yeah. And it was really funny because very opening, very early in the opening to the Mandarins, um, Bouvoir's character is, is sort of making fun of Thomas Mann that she, she doesn't really care <laughs> for him um, and in part because he didn't engage meaningfully in the resistance um, during World War II. He kind of fled and, ah. and turned his back on the fight. And I found that really interesting given what was taking place in this book where it's really this sort of meta commentary on, on the extent to which one should be engaged in life or turned away from its immediacies. And so I found that contrast um, really interesting. Um, and also, I don't know when this is going to stop being shocking to me, but still, you know, the, the city officials like cover up plague when it comes to <laughs> their city because right. acknowledging plague is bad for the economy. And like, man, right. humans. But doesn't that make you feel a little better uh, in a sense, you know, in a, in a kind of twisted way? It's like, OK, so what, what has happened in part during the current uh, plague, the, the current pandemic? It's really not new. It's, 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 this is something that people have done before. Denial, uh, both by officials and by people, uh, you know, affected is like, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun, unfortunately. Yeah. So, no, it doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> like, for, I if, I, if yeah, I feel very much like we're like wily e. coyoteing our way through human existence. And it's like we have the luxury of looking back and seeing like, no, that that's a dark circle painted on a brick wall. That's bad. It's not good. And we just aren't learning. <laughs> we keep running into the same brick wall. And it's while at the same time, like upholding this notion that like what makes humans better than all the other animals is like our capacity for reason. And like, that's right. oh my well, goodness, you know, it's so frustrating. But that's the key word, right? Our capacity for reason. But just because you have a capacity, that doesn't mean you use it. <laughs> and that's pretty obvious, I, I guess. Uh, my, my friends in the history department tell me that, you know, you know the, the, the standard phrase is, you know, those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. And the, ver the variant that they use these days is those who do know history are bound to watch other people repeat it. And it's like, yeah, that's, that, sounds about, that sounds about right. Okay, let's, let's uh, get into the actual novel, beginning with some notes that I made about chapter one, for instance. So the, the novella, as hopefully people have read it, uh, but it's, it's about this uh, somewhat aging, uh, famous, you know, writer who goes into, he needs a break and then he, he goes in one place and then that place is not good on the Dalmatian coast. And then he, then he says, okay, Venice, maybe it's going to be good. And he's not very satisfied with, with his sort of choices of places to rest. Um, and then at some point, of course, he meets this, uh, this really young man and, and, 
called meddling love from a distance uh, with said character. So the first thing that I, and it doesn't end well, by the way. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't read the novel, I suppose I should probably be careful with the spoilers, but um, it doesn't end well for the main character. But one of the first things that, that struck me as interesting is in, the, in chapter one, there is a, a, a quote, uh, you know, a bit that says, um, his yearning for new and faraway places, his desire for freedom, relief, and oblivion was, as he admitted to himself, an urge to flee, an urge to get away from his work, from the everyday side of a cold, rigid, and passionate servitude. And that struck me as uh, interesting because Seneca, in one of his letters to Lucilius, writes about exactly this kind of thing. He says, if you think that the solution to your problems is going to be to just pick up and go and move somewhere else, uh, you are sorely mistaken. And the reason you're mistaken is because, unfortunately, you're bringing yourself with you. And so if, if, you, if you don't actually address your problems, you know, face your problems wherever you happen to be, uh, just because you change uh, location, just because you, 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 you go somewhere else, uh, if you still refuse to address those problems, you're going to have them. They're going to resurface in the same exact situ in, in the same exact form, a, a bit with a different background, with a different, um, you know, a, a different um, specific situation. But the general problem is going to stay. This is not a counsel, by the way, not to travel. Um, of course, I mean Seneca himself traveled all over the place uh, in ancient Rome. It's a it's a counsel not to use travel as a way as a personal psychotherapy, basically, as as thinking that oh well, I I change things, I change surroundings, therefore I'm a new person, right? And I, I actually have known people like that. I, I've known people who think that buying a house, uh, moving to another city, or even moving to another country somehow is going to make their lives better, not in terms of external conditions, because sometimes it does in terms of external conditions, but internal, in terms of internal ones. Um, so what, what, what do you think about this, this thing that th this character is just trying to go to get away from his problems, but in fact, he's kind of carrying them with him? Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think that's exactly right. He, he try, he's aware that something isn't working, but he doesn't engage in the sort of self-assessment or, or self-reflection necessary to really come to a meaningful understanding about precisely what his problem is. And so he ends up in Venice and he ends up, you know, falling passionately in love. And I'm going to put that in quotations because like, I, I'm going to <laughs> conscientiously object to the notion that what he feels for this young boy is is rightly described as as love yeah well, um, we'll get we'll get to that in a minute yeah that's right yeah i, I would agree um, with that that but, but because he doesn't have a real understanding of what's at the heart of his dissatisfaction or his frustration he's unable to act on on what he feels or what he desires or what would actually change his internal circumstances he's got this vague awareness that something isn't right at home and in Venice he seems to become sort of aware at least on the periphery right that there are other ways of living but he never makes the connection um, that he needs to to change his behavior in some way that his way of relating to the world itself is is the, the cause of his dissatisfaction not where he's relating to the world so you want to talk about then uh, straight jump straight into the whether this is love or not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to. Yeah. Okay. So go go for it because you're the one that brought it up. So I, I have my own thoughts about it, but. Um... So so I've been I've been thinking about you know what love is a lot um, in part because of the type of the book that I'm I'm trying to write and just because I'm locked at home with my two children who, you know, I love very dearly, but like sometimes consider eating because it's very difficult. <laughs> um, and, you know, my little one is, is um, very physically and, and verbally affectionate. And he says all the time, I love you so much, mommy. I love you so much. But like, he loves me in the sense that he like desires my presence and he needs me around, but he's not in any way interested in my well-being or my self-actualization. <laughs> and to like right. be very clear, I don't think my eight-year-old should be concerned with any of those things. I think if right. my eight-year-old were, that would be an indictment on my mothering. 
Um, <laughs> well, it would but, be very surprising degree of, of you know, emotional maturity on his part. Which I think could only come about if I had utterly failed him because Probably. he would have to be aware of things <laughs> that would be like totally developmentally inappropriate for an eight-year-old Probably. to know. Probably. And so I think the nature of love, if it's really love, gets at this ability to recognize what is good for the, the, the beloved um, and a desire for their well-being and not necessarily, or at least not exclusively, a desire for possession. And what we see here with Aschenbach, is that how to pronounce his name? Um, yeah, that sounds good enough. <laughs> he desires to possess him and, and he loves this young boy in the way that one would love an, a work of art, that we'd like to possess it and hang it up on the wall and admire it for its beauty, for what it inspires in us. Um, but he doesn't seem to be engaged or in any way concerned with what is good for the young boy. And so to me, that seems like not love. Right. I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things that I like about the ancient uh, Greek treatment of love is that they use a number of words, at least four, to uh, indicate different varieties and different uh you know, meanings of love, they don't, they didn't have, they didn't use a single, a single word. And in fact, even the same word that like eros had a variety of meanings actually, because you could feel <clears throat> what we would consider today erotic love toward, um, you know, in terms of a physical attraction to somebody. But then the idea as it, it is explained by Socrates, none other than Socrates in, uh, in the symposium and Socrates gets it to, from Diotima, who, who is one of the very few women who are knowledge in ancient philosophy as teachers, you know, somebody actually taught love to Socrates. And uh, so we, we learned that eros itself, which is only one of the forms that, uh, one of the, the words that the Greeks uh, used uh, with respect to, to love, actually these different forms, right? Yes, it can start in what we today mean by erotic love, you know, some, a, a strong attraction to, physical attraction to somebody, somebody uh, because of their you know, physical beauty. But then it's supposed to, it's not just that it can, but it's supposed to graduate to a broader, uh, uh, you know, love of the general characteristics of that person, particularly his or her virtue is, you know, has uh, the, the, the characteristic that this person has as, a, as an individual, as a human being, right? Because we're told in the symposium, of course, the physical part eventually dwindles you know with the more you age the less you're attractive physically attractive you are but nice nicely enough if you do things right if you keep you know thinking and improving uh uh yourself then actually your inner beauty so to speak goes up because you become more and more wise right and then even that according to plato is not enough eventually you should just uh, uh graduate to appreciate beauty in general and then finally the last step is the the, the uh, appreciation of the idea of beauty itself, right? The, the platonic idea of beauty itself, which by the way, where the, the phrase platonic love comes from, which doesn't, doesn't imply at all that it should be only known physical. As I just said, it starts out with phys physical love. So when people say, oh, I'm a, you know, it's, it's a platonic love, they, don't, they shouldn't mean that there's no erotic attraction in the modern term. So that's, that's, the, that's the trajectory. Obviously in these cases, you're right, Hashemback doesn't even get to, you know, square one, or at least in, 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 in a sense, uh, or maybe it is a square one, maybe he is actually, you know, he's, he's certainly attracted by the beauty of this young boy, setting aside whether it is actually appropriate for an older man to be <laughs> attracted to an underage, uh, you know, uh, uh, boy, but setting that aside for a minute, he certainly has this, this aesthetic appreciation of the body. But as you say, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any concern about the well-being uh, or, or and certainly no reference to the inner beauty or to the, you know, to the character of this person or anything like that. Although Aschenbach pretends that, um, that there is something like that because he, he actually mentions the, the Phaedrus, uh, one of, one of Pla Pla Plato, Platonic dialogues, right? So you, you, you looked that, 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 that up a little bit, I think you told me, um, the Phaedrus. I did. Yeah. So... Yeah, so what's interesting to me about the, 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 the Phaedrus here um, is that the Phaedrus is both a dialogue about, you know, the nature of love and, and what it means to be the beloved or, or the, the one doing the loving. Um, but it also gets at this notion of like the role of truth um, in rhetoric and, and what that cultivates. 
And so within the Phaedrus, it, it, it moves and he starts talking about how, um, and I think these two things are connected, not least because they appear in the same dialogue. Um, but he says, if you have a rhetorician who doesn't know the difference really between good and bad, even if he's very clever with his words, the harvest that he's going to be able to reap from the seeds that he's sown are going to be no good. And it's going to lead the, the audience listening to his speech astray. And I think something similar is at play here with love. If the lover doesn't have a good sense of what's good love or what's bad, and they're, you know, pursuing their beloved through the streets of Venice, um, whatever right. seeds they're going to be able to reap from that harvest are not going to do them any good. And I think we see that with Aschenbach here in that his love no does nothing good for Paggio, the young boy. Mm -hmm. um, I've probably butchered his name. And it certainly doesn't result in any good for Aschenbach either. This doesn't, you know, inspire him to elevate his behavior. It doesn't cause him to be reflective in a way that, you know, unlocks his frustration or his struggles. It doesn't open up new pathways for living. Um, he remains not really living. I'm trying to not spoil anything. Yeah, right. No, in fact, it actually gets worse, right? I mean, there is a passage throughout the, throughout the novella. So there is a passage, for instance, in chapter three, uh, where we, we read the following. Uh, no sooner did Aschenbach focus on, his, on, on him than somewhat shocked he realized that this was a bogus youth. The man was old. There was no doubting it. He had wrinkles around his mouth and eyes. Horrified, Aschenbach watched him and the way he associated with his friends. Did they not know, not realize that he was old, that he had no right to wear their colorful dandyish clothes, no, no right to pretend he was one of them. So this is an early scene uh, where Aschenbach sees from a distance this older man who's trying to ingratiate basically himself to a bunch of, of younger, you know, young, young boys, exactly the way in which Aschenbach himself will later at least fantasize of, of, of doing. And initially, his response here is somewhat appropriate. He says, like, what the hell? This, this, this guy is a fool. That's, he does not see that he's making himself into a fool, that he's not, that's not the appropriate action. And yet at the end of the novella, we see Aschenbach essentially doing the same exact thing, right? Oh, see, I wrote this. I, I have a note about this too, but I interpreted it a little bit differently. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and so, um, yeah, Aschenbach is like horrified at this man, right? The man who seems the youngest, the most full of life is revealed to be, you know, at least chronologically um, closest to death. And he's horrified at this sort of, dissonance between seeming age and and real age um but yet that old man he's he's engaged if you take it from the the perspective of of the old man's experience right like that mm -hmm. man on that ship he's enjoying life he's content with his lot he's not you know using his age or the seriousness of his profession to to sit on the sidelines of life he's meaningfully engaged with it Whereas Aschenbach never is able to, to, to do that. He's never actually to, able to embrace his life. He gets so caught up in his chronological age and the seriousness of his work that life for him remains a spectator sport. And I feel like his, rever his revulsion to that man dancing on the ship is his unwillingness to like meaningfully take stock of why he's so frustrated and dissatisfied and needs yeah. to embark on this journey. Yeah, interesting. Um, I want to go back to the frustration bit in a, in a minute. I'm just going to remind our viewers that we're going to open Q&A in a few minutes. So if you have a question, you can either put it on, in the chat, uh, which we're both monitoring, or you can raise your virtual hand, not, not like I'm doing right now. And, um, and then we'll call on you live uh, at, some, at some point later in the show. So, yeah. So what is wrong with Aschenbach exactly before we, you know, before we go back then to, to the, to the so-called love relationships? So there's a couple of bits, I think, one near the end of chapter one and the other one near in, in chapter two that kind of get to that point. In chapter one, we read, not that he was doing bad work, Remember, he was a writer, right? The advantage of his years was that he had at least felt calm and certain about his mastery at every moment. But he himself 
though his mastery was honored by the nation, was not, not happy with it. Right? So he's not happy with his own work, even though he's at the height of his, of his powers, so to speak, and he's recognized uh, and he's acclaimed. And then uh, in chapter two, on the same topic, we read, since his entire being was geared to fame, he proved to be, if not exactly precocious, then ripe and ready for the public at an early age, thanks to the lean and decisive quality of his personal voice. He had already made a name for himself when barely out of high school. So there's a couple of points that come to mind here. First of all, uh, of course, the Stoics would say, well, there is your problem. You, you are banking your happiness on fame, on, you know, on recognition by other people. And of course, recognition by other people is outside of your control. And ultimately, it is empty praise. You should be banking on the value of the intrinsic value of your own work, the satisfaction you get from your own work, not regardless of whether it's recognized or, or not, at least ideally, right? It's, it's difficult to get to that ideal stage because we're all human beings. But um, so his priorities are, are, are misplaced. Um, for instance, there is a nice bit in Epictetus' discourses where he talks about a lyre player, a musician, and he says, this guy is excellent, has plays this, this, the instrument incredibly and has a wonderful voice. Uh, and he's completely master of, of, of his own uh, you know, abilities so long as he practices at home. And then as soon as he gets on the stage, he gets nervous and makes mistakes. Why? Well, because he now wants to please somebody else, right? And that's the wrong objective. He should just please himself. And then, you know, whatever comes, comes. Very likely, if you are focused on your work and you do it well, you will please other people. But the pleasing other people should, not, should never be the goal. Yeah, what yeah, you, you you seem to have. Well, I, well, so I have a lot of thoughts going through my yeah. head. You know, oh. one just you know least importantly. So we'll start with that. It reminds me of my own writing. I never think I'm so clever until I sit down to write. Um, <laughs> you know, like no, nothing disabuses me of the motion, the notion that I have worthwhile things to say than sitting down, like typing them up for an audience. And so I've had to get into the habit of like physically handwriting um, a first draft of everything I write, because that's the version for me. And I'm not oh. worried about the audience and I'm not reading it and I'm writing that because I enjoy it. Um, and then the hard work of like transcribing that into a, a typed up form for, for other people to read. Um, but moving back to, to death in Venice, um, Actually, Again, before I, you do move back, and don't forget that thought, I, I want to hear. But okay. I have a comment about the, the writing process itself. So I hear what you're saying. Um, since early on in my career, I have actually rarely had that problem because I always write books with myself at an earlier stage in mind as the audience. Right. So, so when I got into, I don't know, pseudoscience first and then stoicism and stuff like that, and then I started writing books about it, I write to myself and I said, you know, so what a few years ago when you didn't know crap about this stuff, what would you have read that would have been enjoyable and interesting and, you know, and, and appealing? And that's what I write. And, you know, of course, I'm happy if the books sell and if the people praise them or all you know, that's that's human nature. But I honestly don't care when I'm what I'm writing. It's like, OK, I'm writing. I'm, I'm having a dialogue with myself. And that is the whole fun of it. Once the book actually is done and and it goes to the publisher and then it comes out, I'm actually honestly surprised. And I've heard other people, not only writers, but but, um, for instance, uh, movie directors making similar comments. That, you know, like months later or a year later, the book comes out and then people start asking about it. You know, you have you do interviews or, you know, podcasts or something. And I say, oh, yeah, that's right. I wrote that. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't care. I'm already on the next <laughs> project. So it's like, why are you bothering me with this? thing? Of course, it's not a bother. It's, it's an important thing to do. But you know what I mean? So, so it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have that effect. And also, I'm curious when I write because I found out that and that's one of the reasons I couldn't do it actually by hand as you do it. I have to do it using a word processor because I actually discover what I think while I'm writing. Right? So you see, if you tell me, okay, so what do you think about this? And I, well, let me sit down here and start writing about it. And then, oh, that's what I think about it. And so it's kind of fun because it's a, it's a process of self-discovery in a sense. Yeah. So that, so I'm actually really encouraged to hear you say that because I've been, I struggled with this this, this project on grief um, for a little bit. And then I started thinking about, um, well, what? No, keep going. Oh, keep okay. Going. Um, 
I I started thinking about it in the context of like, what would I say to eight year old me having like survived all of this like crazy nonsense? And that actually made it much easier. And the words started to come much easier once I thought of the writing as like, what would I communicate to eight year old me? Um, although we'll see, you know, I don't know that a book geared toward an eight year old is, is really what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but, <laughs> um, you know, I was an unusual eight year old, so who knows? Um, we'll see how that goes. But I thought, um, with what you were just saying, how that relates, um, it's hard for me to imagine someone fresh out of high school actually having anything meaningful to say about the world, like you might, even the most impressive 17, 18 year old, right? Like they might be very good at memorizing facts. They might be really good at, you know, reciting Hamlet's soliloquy, for example, and, and memorizing dates, but they're not, they haven't lived enough life, I feel, to actually have the sort of wisdom necessary um, to, to, to compose a novel such that it would, you know, accurately be um, celebrated by the culture. And so I kind of took this from man as this sort of almost like meta criticism of the culture and of Aschenbach, mm -hmm. um, that if a 17 year old, right, is accurately describing your culture, then it's, it's stiff and it's missing something important. It's not meaningfully engaged in the realities of living and what that entails. And no wonder he's, he's stuck in life and no wonder why he's unable to figure out what he's supposed to do because as far as the environment around him is communicating, right? He's, he's already reached the top. He's already achieved yeah. everything, you know, that's supposed to be achieved and what that is, is is a lack of knowing how to live in the world and so his whole sense of what's good and right and how to orient his sense of, of worth is is wrong and he doesn't even know where to turn to get a better sense of this um so two comments about about yeah. this that's that's an inter those interesting points uh, number one you know, at, at the cost of both of us sounding like old farts, I think you're <laughs> you're right. Uh, in my case, older than yours, but still farts nonetheless. Um, it, you know, it. I think it is a necessary but not sufficient condition for becoming wise and sort of interesting in the sense you're talking about that you have to have life experience and a broader perspective. The broader perspective comes from having life experience. If you don't have it or if your experience is limited, sure, you can still write because, you know, there are young, very young authors who have written uh, about their own experiences, but those are very, you know, tunnel, uh, you know, very, very, very narrow, narrow kind of, uh, of things. It's not, they don't, they cannot reflect a broader wisdom because broader wisdom comes out of experience. I said necessary, but not sufficient, of course, because the other bit that is also necessary and makes it jointly sufficient is that you have to reflect analytically on your experiences. Uh, just because you get older, you don't get wiser automatically. I know plenty of old people who are definitely not wise, right? Because they never engaged in this kind of self-reflection that, of course, Socrates said, uh, you know, without which uh, life is not worth living. You probably exaggerated a little bit. Life may be worth living even without uh, self-reflection, but it's certainly if you want wisdom and if you want to be able to communicate uh, to other people in a meaningful way, your experiences, then, then self-reflection has to be there. So just time by itself isn't going to do it. And by, you know, uh, complementary, uh, self-reflection by itself isn't going to do it. I mean, I can easily imagine, you know, a 17-year-old who is self-reflective in, uh, in, in that sense, but he doesn't have the experience. So he doesn't have a lot of raw material to reflect on. That's, that's, the, that's part of the problem. Yeah, and so this is why I said to you, I had gone back and I had pulled out um, Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols. Cause like, as you know, Nietzsche is, is very critical of, of, of traditional morality and these sort right. of rigid concepts of good and bad and how that you know, interferes um, with our ability to, to live life. And I was thinking a lot about that in regards to this because Aschenbach's life is very rigid. He's very much concerned with these notions of propriety and being successful in very particular ways. Um, but his, his way of living is what I think Nietzsche would describe as sort of anti-life. There's not, there's not a whole lot of, of real living taking place. And I think that's reflective of 
the culture man is sort of of criticizing that it's it, when you're embodied in this environment where what's identified as good versus bad or worth pursuing versus not pursuing you're you're going to to be bereft of what you actually need to to live a life of of value um and yes it might be better than being dead right like some experience is better than than right. no experience um, but it's going to fall so short of what's actually possible or capable in a human life if, if you haven't thought meaningfully about what that is. Yeah, the, the second point that I wanted to bring up based on your comments is this notion of sort of peaking early, right? <clears throat> so this happens by default in a number of professions, like if you're an athlete, for instance, uh, you know, you peak early They're just by the, by the nature of the thing. Uh, it's like, um, you know, in your, in your twenties, maybe early thirties, depending on what sport you actually practice. But then at some point, you know, way before your, your half life, uh, you're done as an athlete. And then, and, and a lot of these people do face the, the question of, oh, so now, now what? And my, the meaning of my life was essentially centered on, uh, being a high level, high performing athlete in whatever, whatever area, whatever field. And now what, when I'm looking at decades coming into the future where I, uh, I don't know what to do, essentially. Um, the, the same goes for some intellectual activities. I mean, in, in uh, uh, among mathematics, mathematicians and physicians, it's a fairly well known trope that most uh, the, the best work that physicians and mathematicians do is when they're very young. Um, in fact, there are exceptions, like I think it was uh, Schrodinger, uh, the physicist who actually peaked later and his biographer said, well, that's because when he was young, he was in love. And so it kind of postponed, the <laughs> he, he postponed his peak to later. Right. And there are writers who are in the same, you know, same sort of situation if they, so like, just like Hashenbach. So if, if you make a big splash early on in your career, it's hard to keep up to, you know, to, to, to repeat that sort of uh, performance, you, you may still write very good things, but you know, getting getting ahead on after another, or even getting better and better and better as the culture pushes you to be, um, is near near impossible. But that again, to me, goes back to what the Stoics were saying: as like, well, that's because it's you you have the wrong aim here, right? You're trying yeah. to go by what the culture says that you should do better and better and better by whatever standards uh, people want to apply. Instead, what you should do is you, you should focus on writing well, according to your own standards, have writing things that are meaningful, according to your own standards, and then let the, the chips fall where they may in terms of how the other people see it, how the audience see it, right? Yeah, I th so yeah, that was exactly how I was going to to respond. That it what what is at stake here is the question of like what it means to live well, um, and how easy it is to get that question wrong, um, and how much easier it is to get that question wrong when the whole world around you is is based upon it is is based upon it knowing what is a good life, right? To be successful in these particular ways. Right. And it's wrong, um, and and there's oh there's a philosopher that his name is escaping me. He gave I think it was a Dewey lecture perhaps, um, and I cannot remember his name. It'll come to me as soon as this is over. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Um, but he described humans um, instead of as like homo sapiens, homo prospectus, and he said mm. so much of human anxiety is that we're always trying to project ourselves into the future, that we're determining the quality of our lives, whether they're good lives, by what our future is going to be like, and not actually engaged in the present reality of, of mm -hmm. living our lives. And I think that that's very similar to what the Stoics are saying, yes, that like where right. you are is now, your life is here, and who knows what next month is going to be like, or 50 years from now, for all we know, you may not even live that long. Um, right. But you're here now, and and how you feel about it now is what matters. Yeah. And Aschenbach seems unable to exist now. That's right. Um, there are a couple of you know, comments in the chat that I want to read you and see, see what uh, let's see what our take is on it. Uh, one from Jeff. Uh, this all fits the notion that aesthetics originates in the fulfillment of other more pressing concerns. This is why it's the province of leisure class. So. Yes and no, right? I mean, it's it's certainly the case that uh, if you live in a society where you you can you have a hard time finding shelter and food, then you're probably not going to be writing a novel, 
uh, or or you know or paint or anything like that. Uh, but then again, there is lots of artists and writers who barely fulfill other concerns and and you know material concerns, and still they actually focus on their art. I mean, it, it's, this is not just a uh, Hollywood. Um, uh, you know, romantic view of the the starving artist who nevertheless pursues art because it's important to him or or her, right? I mean, so what? It, so so there's some truth, I think, into this notion of you know, yeah, art is is uh, is has something to do with having enough leisure, basically, that you're not literally starving or you're not under you know you're not in a war zone or anything like that. Um, although even there, I think human beings do have this this. Um, need almost to, to transcend their awful situations. And one of the ways in which we transcend these awful situations is precisely by art, by engaging artistically or philosophically, of course, if you're so, in, if you're so inclined. Um, what, what do, you, do you have any comment on that? And then, then I have another um, comment from one of the, our what, um, viewers. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think to a certain extent, right? Like, is it Maslow's hierarchies of, of needs like you're not right. going to sit down and write a novel if you're you're starving um you need to you need to eat um but also exactly that when you're confronted with the the horrors of the world sometimes psychologically one of the best ways of overcoming that is is dealing with the counterfactuals of a fictional world and trying to to figure out alternatives in a fictional way so that you can sort of transcribe that into reality um, yeah. In, yeah, in some way, yeah. That makes sense. Well, so Stephen says, although it comes to a bad end, you could see this tale as one of liberation for Aschenbach. Having lived a dry and somewhat sterile life, he breaks free from this and experiences a fleeting period of living freely and experiencing errors. Yeah, but does he? I mean, or is it, or is it just the illusion of errors that he has there? Yeah, so I don't see him as actually breaking free and and experiencing eros or living freely. He doesn't, not just in the absence of like consummating this relationship, um, but he's still largely solitary. He's not formed a new relationship. His life isn't changed. His sense of what should be valued or priority, prioritized doesn't shift, right? He's still trying to get at like how this can, you know, inform his art instead of realizing, you know, like in, in the words of, 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 of Heschel, right? That his life itself is the highest artwork that he can create. And he's not incorporating that at all. And it gets to this tension, right? Like what's, what's better to live, to spend your whole life um, as a miserable, person unhappy, hungry, cold, um, without affection, and then after you're dead, right, to have your art regarded as, as genius and hung up in museums, or um, to, you know, be a celebrated author while you're alive, although it turns out objectively you have no real artistic right. talent, right. Um, right, and to to spend all of your time, you know, giving talks and receiving awards for your great art, um, but to be unhappy, or I, I mix that up, right? So you're, you're this great artist and you never get recognized for it and you aren't wealthy and you aren't rich, but like you have good relationships, um, you feel connected to your community, right? But while you're alive, nobody recognizes it or to be recognized for a great art, like you're that guy who does Michael Coons or whatever, he makes those like metallic balloon animals. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right? But like you, you, you spend your day-to-day -day existence like miserable. Um, what should you actually prefer? Like of what use is, is fame or celebrity after you're gone? And Aschenbach seems just not getting there. Right. Uh, one of our viewers has actually a, a live question or comment. Uh, Britton, I'm going to call on you if you're okay with that. Uh, you want to unmute yourself. Actually, there it is. You can unmute yourself and uh, make your comment live. Hi. 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 Go for uh, it. Well, go for it. Oh, cheers. Thank you. For the host and the co-host. Uh, this novel 
it is about eros. It is a homoerotic novel. And homoeroticism is smacked from the book on, on eros, or the concept of the idea of eros. That being added, uh, that being said, I really don't see any elements of Stoic philosophy in the novella, or the novel. There is a Nietzschean uh, take to it, the contrast between the God of Australian and the shaping form Apollo, or Apollonian, as we call it. Of course, um, you know, this is not my own perspective. I'm reading through the reviews and whatnot, and this, these are the conclusions. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So actually, I want um, uh, Jamie to comment on, uh, on these the Nietzsche part, because I know she has actually done some reading about it. But in terms of the stoicism itself, uh, then, then the, the issue here, the reason I brought up the stoic, stoics is definitely not because the novel has stoic uh, leanings at all. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of stoic philosophy. Uh, what I was saying, however, is that you can, you can read the novel, you can understand why the character is having all this trouble and why his life is, is in, in, in fact, this episode is, of his life is tragic if you look at it from a Stoic perspective, because the Stoics would, would tell you, you know, what you're, what you're doing, Aschenbach, is exactly the wrong way to go, to go about uh, finding meaning in, in your life, and here, here's why. So, yeah, the implication wasn't that uh, the novel itself, the man meant necessarily uh, for there to be a, a component of Stoicism. It's that uh, you can read the novel from that perspective and understand why Aschenbach is having such a hard uh, uh, time. Jamie, you have a comment about, about um, Nietzsche? Yeah, so yes, there's definitely Nietzschean elements in here. And so like Nietzsche's ideal is sort of almost like the opposite of, of the Stoic, right? Which is this sort of like detached reason-based way of living. Nietzsche comes up with this idea of like the, the Dionysian man um, who is engaged in the, the sensual pleasures of life and is is living. Um, and to the extent that this is um, homoerotic, like, yes, he's clearly in love with someone of the same sex as him. Um, but that, that passion never goes anywhere. Um, it's a fire that Aschenbach sits on. And so he, he neither lives up right. to, the, to the stoic ideal of navigating his life through dispassioned reason, nor does he live up to the Nietzschean ideal of embracing, you know, the, the totality of the lived experience and the sort of pleasure um, and being in the worldness that comes from, you know, actively engaged in, you know, particularly the, the sexual pleasures. Um, which, you know, for Nietzsche, he points to as like the, the, the very origin of affirmation of life because it's what gives rise to life. And, and Aschenbach doesn't go there. He keeps himself right. removed from it and doesn't give in to his passions or his desires because he does what Nietzsche identifies as, you know, at odds with life by trying to live up to these, I'm going to call them, you know, corrosive notions of, of good and bad. It's, it's, it's morality in a way that is oppressive rather than leading toward a good life. Okay, we have one more uh, comment or question by uh, Usman. Go ahead. Thank you, Massimo and Jamie, for this very um, good conversation. It's one of my favorite books. Um, I wanted to ask you your opinions and to the uh, people in general, uh, your opinions on um, the relationship between death itself, uh, the plague uh, happening in the book and um, Aschenbach's uh, um, illicit desires because death is mentioned symbolically in the character of the uh, man in the cemetery. It's a very unusual type of episode we witnessed and then the the his description uh man's description of the gondola and the 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 man who takes him out in the sea uh is it's very interesting so what do you think he's talking about when he is talking about death and uh, plague and um Aschenbach's uh, desire is there a connection that he's making maybe the connection is uh, psychoanalytic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jamie. You want to start giving a giving it a, a try? 
on death. What was the connection here between death and the plague and, and Aschenbach? So um, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to go with Albert Camus here. Sure. Um, sorry, you, you've <laughs> gotten to, you've appealed to stoicism. I'm going to go with Camus. Um, but there's a line in, in Camus' novel, The Plague, um, where he says, what's true of all the evils in the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. And I think we can understand it similarly here. Plague and death serve as these, these, these limits, these contrasts against which we're able to judge our lives. And they're there to motivate us or hopefully enable us to, to transcend these limits, to make something of the time that we have while we have it. I think in Death in Venice, Aschenbach doesn't do that. He doesn't rise above himself. He doesn't rise above his circumstances. He sees the, the specter of death is literally all around him. As he sets out on his journey, there's this, you know, seemingly young man who's actually old and then a literal plague infecting the city where he is. And still he, he's proof rock, you know, he rolls his trousers and he maybe eats a peach, but he doesn't live. And I think that's the theme or one of the themes yeah. of this book that he that in trying to to make something of his life and being so preoccupied with that he fails to live and that's a tragedy yes so now again to to uh go back to uh the stoics and particularly seneca he says that again explicitly warns people explicitly about these kind of precisely this kind of danger that is of misliving your life or not not even not paying attention so that your life passes by and you you get to the end of it and you haven't actually started living it and of course as a stoic seneca is also very conscious of the fact that we don't know when that ending is right presumably ashenbach didn't wasn't planning of dying in the plague uh, of the plague uh you, you know he thought throughout most of the story that he had you know a number of years ahead of him depending on what what his age was but that's the point that Seneca makes. It's like, well, we don't know that, right? We, we only have what we would today call statistical expectations about how, live, uh, how long we live, but we don't know. Our life could be, this could be our last day. And that's why he says that we should always live as if this were our last day. Not, this is not to be interpreted literally, meaning that, you know, if I actually knew literally that this was my last day, I probably would be doing a number of things that I, you know, that I've, that I'm not doing today and vice versa. I wouldn't be doing, you know, I wouldn't check my email, for instance, if this was literally my last day, right? But what he means is you, you need to do things that are actually meaningful for you, that actually are in the here and now meaningful and not that they're going to be meaningful just because you think that you have an infinite amount of time ahead of you or a long amount of time I have ahead of you. That's also not to be misconstrued or misunderstood as, you know, oh, so you don't need, you don't want to plan for the future. For the Stoics, the best way to plan for the future is to pay attention to what you're doing right here, right now, because, because the future is outside of your control. Of course, it's not here yet. And the, on, the only way you can affect the future is by actually paying attention to what you're doing. One thing that Aschenbach is certainly not doing is paying attention uh, to where his life is. He's not, he's not a reflective kind of guy. In fact, he fools himself in a number of ways. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. All right. So he says in chapter, I think this is in chapter three, we read, what he found so intolerable, indeed at times so utterly excruciating, was clearly the thought that he would never see Venice again, that he was saying goodbye to it forever. This is at a moment where he's decided to leave Venice, and then in fact he decides to come back. But he's not actually missing Venice, he's missing the boy. And he doesn't realize it yet. He's rationalizing, you know, oh, oh, I'll never see Venice again. But in fact, that's not Ven it's not Venice. It's, this isn't about Venice. This is about the boy. And later on in the same chapter, uh, we read, he had just said goodbye forever to these places, leaving them in the deepest melancholy. And now we're seeing them again within that same hour after being whirled around by destiny and sent back. This is a classic situation where somebody you know something by happens by chance like you know his luggage was misplaced on you know on, on on the train and so he has to stay in venice or uh, because his, his luggage is not traveling wouldn't be traveling with him otherwise and he he sees this he immediately interprets this as a cosmic signal that oh i was supposed to be staying here 
um, because you know this is what the universe has been telling me all, all, all along. It's like, no, the universe isn't telling you shit. The universe is just causing one random thing after another, and you are interpreting those things according to your own preconceptions and rationalizations. So he's, he's really not paying attention and when he does pay attention to what he thinks are cosmic signals, he basically makes up stuff just to rationalize and justify his own choices, his own desires, his own, his own behavior. All right. um, and I don't think either the, the Nietzsche or the, the um, existentialist would, def, would, would, would necessarily uh, subscribe to this kind of behavior. Right? I mean, he's behaving in bad, he's, he's acting in bad faith, it seems to me. Right, because even, right, so, you know, Camus famously says, um, you know, whether or not the world has a meaning, I can't know. And so maybe, right, Aschenbach is, is right. And I'm not saying that he is, right? But let's just say that, you know, there is these cosmic circumstances and the universe is interfering on his behalf because destiny is compelling him to return to Venice and return to the boy. He doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't you know, he, and, and so you're right. So he tells himself this story that, that destiny has intervened and it's sending him back to the boy, but he fails to act. He fails to take any responsibility. And so even if he's correct in, in interpreting the omens, which I'm not suggesting that he is, right. um, but you know, even in the event that he is correct in interpreting the omens, he still doesn't fail to do anything with that and, and move his life forward. He still lives his life as though he's but a spectator to it. Perhaps inevitably in the chat, we're now having a conversation about the, uh, the Apollonian versus the Dionysian aspects of, of Nietzsche's philosophy. You, you want to remind our listeners to what, what the hell you were talking about? And, and what do you think, more importantly, about that contrast? Because I have my own thoughts that certainly don't align with Nietzsche. But... Yeah, so, you know, to be very clear, I am not a Nietzsche scholar. Um, it's not an area that I would claim any sort of expertise in. Um, I just, you know, as someone who's, you know, done a bit of philosophy, I've also read a bit of, of, of Nietzsche. Um, but I think Thomas Mann is certainly playing with what's been listed here. Um, this sort of trying to strike the balance between the role of reason and the role of passion. Um, and Aschenbach doesn't seem able to, to thread that needle, right? Like Aristotle famously talks about like the, the need of a golden mean and that vice can be achieved, virtue can be destroyed in two, in two ways, either through excess or deficiency. And so right. you can have, you know, too much reason. You can be too cold, too calculating, too analytical that you, you fail to live your life at all, right? Or you can be completely devoid of, of reason and analytical ability and run headfirst into a fire. And that's also right. bad. Um, and so I think this is getting at this notion of, of moderation and that to be a human um, is to contain multitudes, that we are all of these things, that we're not just reasonable and we're not just passionate creatures. We're, we have the capacity for all of these and the real trick is in figuring out how to balance them for you know, a flourishing life, not necessarily to be one at the expense of the other, but how to incorporate both yeah that's one of the reasons i do like again the the stoic take on emotions because they don't make this distinction that we still make a lot of people still make today despite the fact that actually even modern neuroscience i should say modern cognitive science doesn't actually support this sort of sharp separation uh that often is implied by this kind of this way of talking between emotions and reasons like oh reason is one thing and emotions the other uh, what the Stoics thought and what actually we, we increasingly find today by way of cognitive science is that actually the human mind is one thing uh, that, that has this complex convoluted combination of what we, for convenience sake, talk, uh, talk in terms of you know, emotions versus reason. And that, uh, so, so the Stoics, for instance, thought that, that it's all that all emotions can be divided into emotions that are according to reason and according and contra to reason, right? So it's all emotional. All our life is, all our, our life as human beings is actually in fact emotional in that sense, meaning that it's driven by emotional responses. If we didn't have emotional responses, we'd be a bunch of psychopaths. Uh, I, and, and nobody, in fact, even though the Stoics didn't know the term psychopath, they actually say, Epictetus at one point says, I don't want you to be unfeeling like a statue. You need to be a human being. 
So you need to feel things to be a human being. The question is whether those feelings, those emotions are in line with reason, as the Stoics would say, meaning, you know, they're the kinds of things you want to cultivate uh, actively, mindfully, or they are against reason, meaning they're the kinds of things that you actually want to move away from, right? And so, um, for instance, you know, the typical examples are uh, of positive, healthy emotions are sort of joy and love, love in the broad sense of, you know, caring about the interest of another person, or even better, humanity at large. Those are uh, those are feelings, those are emotions, but those are in accordance with reason for the Stoics. So those are the kinds of things, emotions you actually want to cultivate. By contrast, uh, fear, hatred, anger, and things like that, those are actually negative or unhealthy emotions. Those are the ones you want to move away from. Why? Because they bring you eventually to do something that you're going to regret. Uh, right, you're you're acting in, uh, in in a way that eventually it will turn out not 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 to be correct. So so one of the things that is going on in my mind, at least in the in the sort of Nietzschean distinction between the Dionysian and the Apollonian, is that even though he does have a point there, that certainly there needs to be a balance. Uh, in a sense, it still implies sort of a dichotomous view of human beings that really goes back all the way to Plato. Right. And you know Plato's uh, image of the of the human mind with the chariot, uh, and uh, you know the chariot, the reason is supposed to be in control, and then there's this horse over there and that other horse over there. Nietzsche basically says that uh, the chariotier shouldn't be in control. There should be an, a, a, a sort of equivalency or balance between between the horses. In the case of the Stoics, they actually say there is no chariotier, there are no horses, there is only one thing, <laughs> the human mind, and it is up to you to try to shape it throughout your life. Uh, in a way that is or is not, uh, you know, in, a, in agreement with the pursuit of, of wisdom and in a, in a good life. Okay, we are only a good a few minutes uh, from from uh, uh, the end of the show. You, any any parting thoughts about uh, man? Well, Jeff G has a hand raise. Why don't you? Why yeah, don't we have sure. him To unmute himself and and yep. share. Jeff, go for it. Share. Uh, let me try it again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna leave my camera off because I get bandwidth problems. No worries. Um, yeah, it's just it, it's it's Usman's question puts it really nicely. It's like, is this is this really suicide by cholera, or or as I was saying, uh, isn't the tension of the novella? I remember when I was reading this. It's just like it's like it's like it's like slow motion death. It's like is is he what what is it about this attraction that is like more important than just staying alive because it's pretty clear that he knows that that, that this is going to be his undoing um <laughs> so i just wanted to sort of you know that that's it and, and it's the, the 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 title says i think indicates pretty clearly that's what that's what on uh you know one this is this is what this is what you're supposed to take away from the novel right is that he, why, why can't he tear himself away from the boy, even knowing that the plague is coming upon him? Right. Yeah. yeah the, the good question. Um, Jamie, do you have any comments about? Yes. So yeah. there, um, before I was in love with Albert Camus, there was Oscar Wilde. And um, he's got this, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he's got this great line where um, he says, the only way to resist temptation is to yield to it. And it took me a really long time to understand just what the hell he meant by this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we have an example of it here. Aschenbach is, is tempted by the passionate life. He's tempted by arrows that he feels, um, but he can't resist the temptation because he can't yield to it. And because he's never given into it because he's never experienced this, He's not able to, to set it aside and accept it for whatever it is and move on with his life. He's stuck. And so if he really wants to be able to, to do the life affirming thing and continue to live, he's got to give in to his passions. He's got to, in some ways, you know, surrender control and he doesn't. And so the temptation still has its hook in him and ultimately it leads to his demise. That's right. All right. On, on that note, I think this was a, a, an interesting discussion. Uh, it's yet another example of how you can philosophize on, on, philosophize on the basis of literature. You don't have to read philosophy books. In fact, a lot of philosophy books 
our literature, beginning with Plato, because, you know, Plato, for, for all the fact that he railed against the poets and, uh, and he expelled them from his Republic, it turns out the Republic itself, in fact, ironically, is a work of literature. It's a fictional dialogue, right? <laughs> um, so, um, and that's what we're going to try, we're trying to do, we've been trying to do, and we will uh, keep doing this uh, in this book club. We'll, we'll keep alternating uh, maybe a couple of works on nonfiction with one uh, fiction. Speaking of which, I want to remind you that the next book club is going to be on January 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. That's, sun that's a Sunday. And the book that we will discuss is entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women by Kate Mann. That's definitely not a novel. It's not a work of fiction. Um, it's, a, it's a work of it's a regular philosophy. Not for that, the, however, uh, any, any less interesting. So again, um, thanks, everybody. Yeah. I just want to, it's, it's accessible in so far as philosophy yes. goes. Some philosophy right. can be really hard to read, which I don't think undermines its quality as philosophy. Um, right. But for a perspective, like I sat down and I read entitled in one sitting on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. We'll try to stay away from, uh, from philosophy books that are not um, accessible. Like, you know, uh, critique of pure reason is probably going to be last on our list. <laughs> <laughs> also, reasons and persons, we won't go there. Right. There's a lot of stuff that we're not going to go there. Yeah. Uh, all right. So thanks again to everybody for, for coming. Thanks, Jamie Lombardi, for uh, this nice conversation. And uh, we'll see you in January, fate permitting. Bye. Thank you.